America at Home presents imagery of idealized visions of American home life. These paintings provide glimpses of tender, private moments in family gardens and parlors, portraits of angelic children, and scenes of mothers caring for their families. At the same time, depictions of lavish interiors appealed to Americans' material aspirations. These works offer different views of domestic spaces. In some, home is a personal refuge or sanctuary. Some paintings suggest a narrative of domestic life, and in others, a reflection on decades-old commentary on a woman's role inside and outside of the home. Like the America at Home collection, the works of the contemporary Upper Peninsula artists also reveal an appreciation for family and home life. In their artwork, value is placed on family relationships and care for the domestic space. Some do not shy away from life's truths and present a more frugal reality or an appreciation of a simpler life, while others appeal to materialistic urges. Seymour Joseph Guy established a reputation as one of the finest American genre painters of children. Best known for his detailed and highly polished domestic scenes, his work is distinctive for its combination of portraiture with genre painting, scenes of people engaged in commonplace activities. Interior with Children exemplifies this aspect of his work, depicting a boy and a girl, possibly brother and sister, who are clearly painted from life, seated in a lavishly decorated Victorian room. The boy is focused on placing a flower in the girl's hair while she gazes fixedly out at the viewer. Both children, their clothing, and the decorative elements throughout the room are meticulously rendered with the finest of details. This style of painting caught the interest of Richard Manoogian, who collected the artwork in the Visions exhibit. Seymour Joseph Guy's painting makes for an interesting comparison with UP artist Christine Sari's Interior with Children. While they both share the same title and subject matter, their styles and narratives differ, most notably in the interaction between the two children. Guy's children are angelically posed. The young boy most likely would have been directed to place a flower in his sister's hair, whereas Sari's children are caught in action. The artist captures a candid moment in the middle of a shared conversation. This is no stage scene, as this natural act occurs in real setting, presenting a truly intimate glimpse into this domestic space. The works in America at Home offer different views of domestic spaces. In some, home is a personal refuge or sanctuary. Francis Davis Mullet's The Window Seat shows a young woman lost in focus as she crochets on a window seat. Although needlework and sewing were the quintessential domestic task, the window seat presents this activity as a creative endeavor rather than a chore. In views like this, Mullet appeals to the familiar and casual intimacy of domestic life. From a technical aspect, the painting is about light, interior and exterior light, light falling through glass and light filtered through the muslin, light modeling form and light reflected off of form. Through the windows, cool light dances off the polished surfaces of the interior, the table with its propped open book and floral still life, the spindle chair on which the woman rests her feet and glows within the varying layers of white curtains. In Helen's Kitchen Eben, artist Christine Sari captures the kitchen basking in the morning glow and in a quiet, peaceful moment of respite between meals and activity. Helen's Kitchen represents the theme of domestic life in a simple, honest, rustic setting. The interior details suggest a narrative of daily routine and a wholesome lifestyle. The light, similar to that of Mullet's The Window Seat, bathes the countertop in white light, adding this sense of a sacred space that is, in the words of the artist, akin to an altar. In William James Glacken's painting, Women Picking Flowers, represents how flower gardens became common for upper-middle-class American homes in the early 1900s. By cultivating gardens, women in turn cultivated an idea of female refinement. Nourishing their gardens served as a metaphor for nurturing their families and gave them refuge from the outside world. Energized by the charm of small towns, rows of quaint houses, and the beautiful harbors, Georgie Senoff of Hancock captures the rugged neighborhoods in the hillside communities of Houghton and Hancock on a warm, blustery day. The warm palette and hurried brush strokes add a dreamlike element to this existing location, but at the same time offers a welcoming nod to viewers. A long line of hung laundry indicates a good amount of time spent on a household chore, and that the fall breeze was timely. Frank Weston Benson was one of the last great American Impressionists and among the most celebrated painters of his day. Recognized for his mastery of the effects of light, Benson's portraits studies in the contrast of light and shadow, 
as seen here with a portrait of Elizabeth Tyson Russell. This strong counterpoint of light and dark was a technique Benson had learned from the European masters while studying in Paris. While Benson was commissioned to paint idyllic portraits of the children of the aristocrats of his day, Rennie Michaud of Ishpeming incorporated fabric from the H.W. Gossard garment factory into the collage of this Eupert youngster to reflect the history of this one-time employer. With this portrait, the artist retells the story of the woman who took to the picket lines over low wages and working conditions. The portrait of Castell reminds the artist of the children who would wait by the factory's back stairwell on payday. Walking home with their mothers, they would stop along the way at the old Olson's news store for penny candy, remembrance both gentle and strong for the appreciation of simple pleasures. Unlike the -the of-the-times imagery of demure, modest women quietly embroidering or caring for their children, John George Brown's figure of a liberated woman, with her head tilted back, liberated in her unladylike pose and her reform-style dress, with a natural waist and no corset. At a time when it was considered scandalous for a woman to smoke, she extends her arm, emphasizing the cigarette in her hand. When this painting was made, the fight for women's right to vote was also in full swing. By presenting her defiantly, cigarette in hand, is the artist celebrating or questioning this woman's liberated status? Mara Manning challenges the stereotypical role of females with her playful comment on expectations society puts on girls growing up in the 60s. Patterns for Girl was part of a series of work based on reading flashcards from the 1960s. Learning to read is about recognizing patterns in language and making sense of them. The artist used sewing patterns in the work and kept the flatness of the image to reinforce this concept. John F. Francis was one of the leading still-life painters in the mid-19th century, and still life with wine bottles and basket of fruit is considered one of his finest. The painting depicts a lavish array of abundance, suggesting a special occasion for those who could afford such luxuries. Bottles of wine and accompanying glasses, a blue and white pitcher of water, a basket of fruit and nuts strewn over the cloth-covered table, a variety of textures evoking the sense of touch, and the cheese and open oranges appeal to the sense of smell. Christine Sari inserts the human figure into her image of abundance. Almost lost in the still life, we see a man sitting amiss his favorite possessions. The table is set, welcoming, but the setting is full, almost frenetic, as he has filled the picture field with dinnerware, statuary, and photographs, carefully selected and laid out in an elaborate display that becomes autobiographical. In his ancestral robe, as if dressed for company, the subject is placed amidst his treasures, as if a prop himself. In the second half of the 19th century, Robert Spear Dunning's illusionistic still-life paintings of fruits and flowers preserved a conservative painting tradition with its roots in the pre-Civil War period. When this painting was created, these fruits were expensive luxuries. As the United States expanded its global economic and political presence, fruits from around the world found their way into the affluent American homes. Spear's characteristic arrangement celebrated beauty and abundance available to the tables of post-war gentility, images evoking a domestic life of ease and grace that found favor with mid-century tastes. Norma Thompson's post-war still life moves away from suggestions of lavish abundance into the realities of what is readily available by presenting an onion, a simple root crop that is essential to any kitchen. Playfully arranged in multiples, one onion is stacked on top of the other on the cutting board as if we are interrupting a domestic task. Even the media selected by the artist is simple and basic, watercolor and gouache on newspaper.